Farnworth's population grew rapidly during the Industrial Revolution. Coal mines and mills were established here in rapid succession, resulting in the population growing almost 20-fold in just 60 years, between 1801 and 1861. Some of these mills still stand in the northern part of the town. Next to them is Moses Gate Park, one of the most beautiful parks in the borough, and Knob End nestled between the rivers Kroll and Irwell. Both were once home to some of the largest bleach works in the county. It is great fun walking around these rural areas and finding remnants of that industrial heritage. Evidence of that rich heritage can also be found when you walk along Market Street. This ordinary-looking industrial building has an exciting story to tell. The sign above the entrance, the Phoenix Club, has meaning only to those who know the story behind it. This venue was used as the filming location for the successful sitcom Phoenix Nights, starring Peter Kay. Kay is a very familiar face on British TV. He was born here in Farnworth in 1973 and grew up in the area. He was brought up following his mother's Roman Catholic faith. And he attended the local Mount St. Joseph School just a stone's throw away from this club. Kay left school with only one GCSE in art. However, that didn't stop him going to the University of Salford to study media performance. His alma mater also awarded him an honorary Doctor of Arts degree in 2016, recognising his contribution to the entertainment industry. His performing career started in 1997 when he attended and won several competitions, including Channel 4's So You Think You're Funny. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, his career as a comedy performer started to pick up. He made several guest appearances in various TV comedy shows, such as Granada TV's Last Last Show. He also presented the BBC Two, The Sunday Show, with a slot called Peter Kay's World of Entertainment. His success led him to create the sitcom Phoenix Nights. He co-wrote and directed several episodes. The sitcom was a great success and later led Kay to create another sitcom, Max and Paddy's Road to Nowhere, a spin-off from Phoenix Knights, co-starring Paddy McGuinness. Phoenix Knights' plot revolves around a rivalry between two performance clubs, one run by Kay's character Brian Potter. His ideas to attract more people to the club created many comedy situations that made the sitcom and the club so popular. Peter Kay continues to perform. He is now an award-winning comedian, an author, and he has had a few number one singles in the UK music charts. This delightful building was originally built in 1810 by Roger Holland, a mill owner and a cotton manufacturer living in Farnworth. He was concerned by the low level of education and religious affiliation of the children in town, who were primarily educated in Sunday schools. He decided to establish a new Sunday school based on Methodism. There were two other free schools already in Farnworth and Kersley. However, the children came from working class families and couldn't be spared from work. This meant education on Sunday was their only option. In a meeting led by distinguished people of the town, it was agreed that a new Sunday school for all denominations was needed for the poorer children. Many of the prominent people from the town who attended the meeting offered their services as teachers without pay. The school was opened at the beginning of 1808 using Farnworth Grammar School facilities. The school was successful and many children attended. While the premises were initially provided by the grammar school, these were insufficient for the growing number of pupils so Roger Holland purchased the piece of land at the corner of Church Road on which the current building was built. While Holland was a Methodist, he didn't link the school with a Methodist congregation as he wanted it to remain open for children of all denominations. 
Even after his death, the trustees of the school maintained this approach. The school had an interesting management method. The school's governors allowed the teachers to set up rules in regular meetings to resolve specific issues. This continued for over 150 years, with more than 100 rules set. All these rules from the first to the last were observed until the school's closure in 1990. The school was refurbished in 1868. One noticeable feature of the school is the clock face above the entrance door. Inside the school, there was a wooden memorial dating back to 1922. There were 108 names on the board, 18 dedicated to those who lost their lives during World War I. The school was closed towards the end of the 20th century. Since its sale, there has been a Holland School Trust Fund set up. The annual interest fees for the school are used to provide additional funds to support further religious, educational and charitable activities. Nowadays, the building is used as a nursing home and is known as the Hollands. The charming town of Farnworth, located in Greater Manchester, rests on the rivers Irwell and Kroll and has various historical points of interest. There are several opinions as to the origins of the town's name. One is the name Farnworth is derived from the Old English fern, meaning fern, like the plant, and worth, meaning enclosure. Originally a hamlet in the Middle Ages, it was initially held by the Lords of Barton. In the early 14th century, the ownership of Farnworth was taken over by the Holton family, who lived in Over Holton. Like many towns across Britain, during the 18th and 19th centuries, the town rapidly grew to accommodate the expanding coal mining industry. Several mills were built alongside the coal mines, established around Dixon Green, west of the town centre. The Manchester, Bolton and Bury Canal building work also provided employment. As a result, the population went from 439 in 1801 to 8,720 in 1861. The small town only measures approximately two miles from east to west and the breadth is just over a mile. Despite its relatively small size, there's a range of parks and amenities to enjoy for both residents and visitors. Farnworth now has a population of around 27,000. It's well connected with several rail and road networks to access across the country. The beautiful Town Hall building, located on Market Street, is built from brick and set in a neoclassical style. It was erected in 1863 and designed by architects Bradshaw, Gass and Hope. While the building has a range of magnificent features, one of the most notable is the front porch comprising several delightful ionic order columns characterised by the use for loot or scroll-like capital and are narrower than the other column orders. There are several features of great interest inside the building too. These include a large stained glass window located near the staircase. Take a closer look and you'll see the council coat of arms here. In addition, there are war memorials from Farnworth Grammar School on display. In 1974, when Farnworth was incorporated into the Metropolitan Borough of Bolton, the building was used by the newly appointed Bolton Council. However, in later years, the building was left to fall into disrepair. In June 2013, after a much-needed refurbishment programme costing £1.3 million, the building was reopened. Face-to-face -face council services have moved next door into Farnworth Library. The town hall is Grade 2 listed. This magnificent edifice is Farnworth Library. The structure itself is comprised of red brick and contains a variety of sandstone dressings. One of the most notable features has got to be the central white dome that sits neatly on top of the structure. 
Take a glance up towards the parapet and you'll notice the words Carnegie Library carved in stone. Just like many other libraries across the UK, the building's construction was funded by Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie was a wealthy Scottish American philanthropist and regarded as the richest man in the world in 1901. He believed that wealthy men were trustees of what they owned and should administer it to the benefit of the general public. For this reason, Carnegie provided funds for the construction of libraries and civic amenities across the world. The first Carnegie Library was built in his hometown of Dunfermline. The library was designed by local architects Bradshaw and Gass and was opened in 1911. The building is Grade 2 listed. The park is an unlikely place to find a memorial for this remarkable woman, Mary Barnes. However, given her husband's uncle, Thomas Barnes, established the park, it's a fitting place to remember her. Mary Barnes was quite the character. She was prominent in the women's suffrage movement in Farnworth, which is why she's remembered today. Throughout her life, Barnes dedicated a significant amount of time to fight for women's rights. She was involved in women's suffrage for about 40 years. Although she was born in Staley Bridge, Barnes relocated to Farnworth to marry successful cotton manufacturer Harold Alfred Barnes. Mary had a very fortunate position in comparison to many of her peers. Using her status to her advantage, she contributed to this important movement. In 1922, Barnes became the first female town councillor for Farnworth. She was very determined, making it her duty to campaign for better housing and education. She also looked to improve living and working conditions for the local people. Six years later, in 1928, as a result of the pressure of the women's suffrage movement, all women over the age of 21 were able to vote. To mark the memory of this brave individual, you'll discover a plaque in her honour located in Farnworth Park. The picture of Barnes, shown here, displayed in the Farnworth Library, was painted by artist Keith Robinson. The image, commissioned by the Town Council and unveiled in 2019, has several important features worth noting. The tree seen through the window represents the ash tree Mary Barnes planted in the park on 14th of December 1918. It commemorates the day women over the age of 30 who met specific criteria were eligible to vote for the first time. Above Barnes's head, a photograph of a group of women who belong to the Tipperary Club is on the wardrobe. This club provided the social network and support for the female relatives of serving men. A photo of an elderly man on Barnes's right, second from the top, is her husband's uncle, Thomas Barnes. Above that photograph is her husband, Harold. The red, white and green flower display illustrates the colours of the National Union of Women's Suffrage. The OBE medal Barnes was awarded in 1921. Photo of Barnes's two children on the dresser. On Barnes's shirt is a brooch representing the emblem of the National Union of Women's Suffrage. Taking a stroll around Farnworth Park, you'll notice a variety of places of interest. One is this cenotaph, appropriately named the Farnworth Cenotaph. A cenotaph is a monument to an individual who has passed away. Gazing up at this marvellous piece of stone, you'll see a figure made from bronze that depicts a woman holding a wreath of laurel on her head. Alongside this, you can make out carvings of wreaths on each side of the column, which are commonly adopted as an allegory for the circle of life. The monument is dedicated to those who lost their lives during World War I. There are 821 names listed on the base of the memorial. 
This cenotaph was unveiled in 1924 and was designed by J. and H. Patterson of Manchester. The cenotaph and Farnworth Park are both Grade II listed. Interestingly, the cenotaph has been listed since 2000. The park only acquired its listed status in 2001. At the back of the park is a commemoration of Thomas Barnes. This memorial was erected to commemorate his contribution to the town and to establishing this park. Born in 1812, Barnes was one of three sons. He was born to a wealthy family. His father was James Rothwell Barnes, who built Farnworth's first steam weaving mill and in 1832 introduced cotton spinning to the town. In 1864, Thomas Barnes gifted the park, initially part of his estate, to the town. It marked the coming of age of his son and the memory of his father. Throughout his life, Thomas Barnes had a range of professional interests. In addition to his textile business, he was chairman of the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway. He was elected Liberal MP for Bolton on two occasions. 1852 and 1861. Thomas Barnes passed away in 1897 at the age of 85. This memorial to Barnes, located towards the southwest end of the park, was erected in 1895, just two years before his death. Gazing across this fishing pond that was once the water reservoir for the mill, you'll notice an industrial building. This is Cobden Mill. Its origins date back to 1890 and it was built by John Harwood and his son. Located on Gower Street, Cobden Mill was once in a very populated area. It employed hundreds of people in its heyday. The original purpose of the mill was for cotton spinning. This is unsurprising considering this industry stretched across the northwest of Britain when the mill was built. The building itself is made up of five storeys. It's built from brick with a flat roof. Internally, the majority of the columns are made of steel. One feature of great interest is the octagonal chimney stack that has survived despite being weathered down. Since its initial construction, the building has undergone various alterations, including the addition of four bay windows that date back to the early 20th century. Alongside this, there are multiple other external buildings, including a former canteen. Nowadays, the mill is used for commercial purposes. You can discover a range of different companies utilising this old, yet magnificent building. A second mill in this area, but one that's an impressive and poignant edifice, is Horrocks Mill also known as Lawn Street Mill. Like many other mills located in the north of England, the building is characterised by its red brick design. The bricks get their colour from the type of clay, which is abundant in the north of England, and the process in which various oxide substances are added to the clay make them red. The original mill was the brainchild of John Horrocks. He was an industrial pioneer throughout the late 1700s and early 1800s. Hordock's original mill no longer exists as the company he founded merged with Crudson, Crosses and Co Limited in 1887. They already had a mill on the site. The current building was built in 1915. The building hosts a variety of interesting features. While it's been modified over the years, the structure is an excellent example of 20th century mill architecture. The complex has several buildings of various heights. The central building's distinctive towers on each corner feature ribbed pilasters and curved corbelling ceiling supports. The southeastern tower has a pyramidal roof. Horrocks used lavish embellishment and unusual architectural forms to emphasise the company identity. John Horrocks was born in Edgeworth, Lancashire in 1768. 
He was a successful cotton manufacturer and a member of parliament for Preston. Horrocks was a pioneer in the factory system and was one of many people who revolutionised the cotton industry in Lancashire and the North. Horrocks passed away suddenly in 1804, aged 36. The structure itself is Grade 2 listed and was registered on 4th of November 1966. Unfortunately, despite this, one of the mill buildings was demolished in 2008 without permission. Arriving here is a bit of a walk from the town centre, but it's worth it. This is one of the finest country parks around and is called Moses Gate Park. In the park you'll find Crompton Lodges, small former mill ponds named after the Crompton family who originally owned the park. Stretching for a vast expanse of around 750 acres, the park was originally an industrial site. Like many regions in the north of England, there were once several industrial mills operating here. It's hard to believe, but it's not always been as picturesque as it is now. Occupied by mills, bleach works, sewerage treatment plants and coal mines, the smells and sights must have been damaging wildlife and human health. The largest factory here was Farnworth Paper Mills. In the 1820s, they became one of the largest suppliers of paper in England. During the papermaking process, the River Kroll was used as the main supply of water. The river became so severely polluted by industrial waste that the paper mill couldn't use the water. Crompton created the lodges to supply the paper mill with clean water. Nowadays, the park is a wildlife haven. If you look closely, you'll spot a variety of different creatures. These include swans, kingfishers, herons and brown trout. In addition, the park has become home to a wide range of other species of waterfowl. One of the more beautiful flowers that can be found here is the common spotted orchid. A small, dense flowered stem growing up to 60 centimetres. The light lilac coloured flowers show a distinctive pattern of loops, coloured in deep lilac. Perfect for a pleasant weekend walk. Moses Gate Park is well worth a visit. Once a prominent residential home and a fine example of an early 19th century building, Rock Hall is located close to the lodges in the park. Rock Hall was built in 1807 for John Crompton, a local paper manufacturer and a business person who died before living here. The hall passed to his son, Thomas Bonser Crompton. Rock Hall is nestled amongst blossoming trees and a lawn that rolls to the front of the property. T. B. Crompton was an influential figure in Farnworth's history. He was born here in 1792 into a paper manufacturing and bleaching family. He inherited several mills in the area. With his managerial and technical skills, he expanded the business to become one of the largest paper suppliers to the big newspaper publishers in London. He made improvements to the Fordrinia paper machine. This allowed the wet paper to be dried as part of the manufacturing process, generating the continuous production of paper into large rolls. This is still done today. Crompton used his knowledge of the business and connections to persuade the government to abandon the classification of paper for excise duty. This simplified the paper supply chain, sending it directly to the end consumer, the newspapers in Fleet Street for example. Until this change, the paper was sent to Somerset House in London for stamping and taxation. This caused the process of paper supply to prolong and more expensive. The building you can see is comprised of brickwork and a slate roof. There are a variety of noticeable features to admire here. These include panelled doors and sash windows. Internally, when it was possible to enter in, there are various iconic order columns and an excellently preserved fireplace. The structure is Grade 2 listed and was registered on 19th of August 1986. 
Unfortunately, the house is currently boarded up and needs restoration. The small stream you're standing next to may not impress you much. But look at the brickwork at the far end of the pond and you may start to see why it's important. The brickwork is all that's left of the locks on the Manchester, Bolton and Bury Canal. The Industrial Revolution meant heavy goods and materials needed transportation around the whole of the country. The canal network provided a reliable and economic way to transport large quantities of goods around the country. While this was not the only use of canals, it was the principal reason for their construction, especially given the poor road network at the time. The first Canal Act was passed in 1791, with the first Greater Manchester Canal opening in Salford just six years later in 1797. Only the Sankey Canal in St Helens predates this, which opened in 1757. The Manchester Bolton and Bury Canal, MB and B, was built between 1791 and 1808. The canal barges on the MB and B Canal predominantly carried coal and salt. By the 1960s, many of the canals had fallen into disrepair. Like many canals in Britain, there's a range of interesting architectural features to enjoy along the Manchester, Bolton and Bury Canal routes. Some of these include the Prester Lee Aqueduct and the Clifton Aqueduct. Both aqueducts are Grade 2 listed. In 2013, a new steel bridge was opened just 100 metres north from where you stand, featuring a Meccano-style design. This green and red structure was assembled from steel fragments bolted together like Meccano, the toy manufacturer, pieces. Since it fell into disrepair, there have been several movements to reconstruct the MB and B canal network, with the latest taking place as recently as 2015. Nowadays, canals are predominantly used for recreational boating. Taking a stroll along the picturesque River Irwell, it's hard to imagine this tributary of the River Mersey was once a highly polluted waterway. The Industrial Revolution caused huge pollution issues and various local councils, environmental organisations and heritage groups are still working hard to reverse these damaging effects. The River Irwell rises at Deer Plain Moor near Backup in the South Pennines. It travels for around 39 miles until it reaches the Mersey near Erlam, a district of Salford you'll find various historical points of interest along the river, including Prestley Bridge and Prestley Aqueduct. Prestley Bridge was built in the 1790s as a packhorse bridge. It's older than the Prestley Aqueduct and is built entirely from stone with a noticeable band and parapet. The bridge itself is small and measures only 5 foot in width. The Prester Lee Aqueduct was built in the 1790s. It was initially constructed to benefit the Manchester Bolton and Bury Canal. It's built of both stone and brick and has four carefully curated arches lined with brick. The aqueduct is no longer used for water transport, so it has been converted to a footbridge. Both the Prester Lee Aqueduct and the bridge are Grade 2 listed. If you look at the map, this area is a river peninsula and was home to one of the largest employers in Farnworth. As part of the manufacture of cotton, the raw material needed whitening and bleaching became the common process to achieve this. Since this process needed large amounts of water, this area became a perfect location for knob-end bleach works. Knob-end bleach works dates back to the mid-18th century. The term knob end originates from the Old English rounded point of higher land, whilst the bleach works were found along the canal in Farnworth. The location for the works also crossed over into the neighbouring territory of Little Lever. Bleaching cotton was done here for many years. Using the water of the River Irwell and techniques involving acid made from fermented sour milk, 
left to dry and then boiled in alkali. It was a process that required several rounds to get the right cotton colour. The bleaching process took weeks and was improved in the 1760s using sulfuric acid, better known at the time as oil of vitriol. The official date for the start of the bleaching works here is 1760. In 1785, Benjamin Rawson Jr. joined the operation, improving and expanding it. His father was a chemical manufacturer from Bradford. The effect on the environment was described in a report, probably at the turn of the 19th century. It said, Mr. Rawson's vitriol works, the walls of which appeared blackened by the subtle acid, the trees around them are blighted and all things, for some distance, by their appearance, acknowledge the terrible effect of this power. Rawson sold his bleach works to Edward Wilson in 1834, when it became known as Prestoli Alkali Works. Wilson owned a factory that produced alkali efficiently as a base product for manufacturing soap, glass and paper production. He expanded the factory so it occupied almost half of Knob End. With the improvement in the process and expansion, the effects on the neighbouring areas became unbearable. Due to the smoke from the surrounding factories, the rain in Farnworth became acidic. This, along with the spillage of untreated acid, made the area known as Stink Bomb Hill. Parliament introduced the Alkali Act in 1863 and enhanced it further in 1874. The Act meant manufacturers had to improve their production and minimise waste. This, along with reduced profits, led to the chemical works closure in 1875. It's estimated that 2,000 tonnes of alkali soda were produced here a month at the height of production, with a total of 4,000 tonnes of waste. This waste is most of the mass on Knob End. Nowadays, Knob End is currently regarded as a site of special scientific interest, SSSI. The area had traditionally been used as a dumping ground for various chemicals and byproducts of the mills. However, it has now been transformed into a wonderfully rich habitat and vibrant area of grassland. As you stand on this bridge, the river at the bottom of the gorge is the River Crowell. The river passes Queen's Park and is one of several rivers seen in and around the Bolton area. This is one of the smaller rivers in the region, with a length of about 10 miles. Despite its length, it collects water from several tributaries. It starts just west of the town, near Middlebrook, and flows eastwards towards Bolton, where it flows underground, beneath the town centre. It turns south towards Farnworth, and flows into the River Irwell, just at the tip of Knob End. The river's name comes from the Old English Crow and Weller, meaning a winding river.